Um, and I do have a list, um, a, a quick story, and most of mine are stories that I think hopefully illuminate some of the things I want to say for the good of the community and the good of artists, etc. And when I uh, got the theme of local, that's what I wanted to think of, is, is what stories that I have that are localized and rooted here. Um, and with the list, I have a story. Um, I was one of the last holdouts in the modern world to not get a cell phone. And my oldest daughter, who is currently 12, going on 18, was in her second day of kindergarten at Alexander II Elementary School. And at the time, I was at the museum. And I got a call about four o'clock. And it was my daughter at the school saying, Daddy, are you going to come get me? I had forgotten her <laughs> on her second day of school. So my wife, who's a mental health care caseworker, uh, made sure that I had a cell phone. And she always tells me to get my list so I don't forget. So I have my list so I don't forget some of my stories. Um, a couple of stories, I think, to sort of set up my strange route to making through the arts. Um, I was a student at Mercer University. And from day one, I wanted to be an art major. And my brother would follow the year afterwards, and he would also be an art major from day one. And there's two stories from that time period, and part of this is sort of, maybe it's either the art major blues or the reconciliation of the art major. My brother told me on his first day of signing up for classes that he was sitting across from someone in the registrar's office who was going over his statistics and said, straight A student, he had SATs that were unbelievable, he was involved in things in school, and so the counselor looked over her paperwork and said, Mr. Odell, very impressive, what do you want to study? And he, you know, I want to be an art major. And the counselor looked at him and said, what a waste. That was, that was rather harsh. It didn't deter him at all. As a matter of fact, he now runs a website out of Macon, uh, starcasm.net, that has anywhere from five to seven million visits a month. And all of that can be rooted back to his art education at Mercer. My story comes at the other side of the academic journey at Mercer. I was at the Coliseum, where they used to hold the graduation ceremonies. And I was there with my mom and dad from Florida. I grew up in the cultural mecca of Panama City, Florida, by the way. So any uh, lewd things I might say, I, I, I credit to that locale. Um, I was walking out. I'm going to put this down for a moment. I was, I was walking out of the Coliseum with one arm around my mother, the other arm around my fiance, the mother of the children I was just mentioning. Uh, we were a week away from getting married. A diploma in my hand. And as I was walking out, I looked over and had one of these surreal moments where I saw a television set and it was me talking on the TV. And I was reminded that the Mercer recruitment office, and I do love Mercer, had interviewed me my last quarter at school to talk about my experience. And I was, oh, here's my chance, right? Ah, uh, great books were fantastic. I was a philosophy minor. It helped root me in the tradition of thought and Western, Western ideals. And art taught me skills. I could spend time with my professors. All of those things that meant so much to me. And this was my chance to sing that. And as I'm looking over there, there I am at my moment of launching into the world. And I look, and a subtitle comes up. And it says, John, business major. Oh my God, right? I called, I begged, I pleaded, please don't do that. I want people to see that this is someone who was an art major. And of course the response was, Mr. Odell, we've made 300 of these, they can't be changed. And I got the distinct sense that they really weren't trying to recruit people who wanted to do what I did. They wanted to use me to get folks. That's fine, that's fine. And I meet students regularly now, I do a lot of teaching, and a lot of folks who are dealing with the issue of the trauma of being an art major. And, and the thing I want to say about that is, at the very least, take them as grains of sand and form a pearl around them. Let them motivate you. But the other thing is that I've come to learn that a place, a locale, is identified by what is made or created there. And the example, the story I have with that came with my dear friend Charlie Thomas when she took this poor, ragged, pickup driving Panama City redneck to Paris, France. <laughs> Whew. 
And I found myself in a park with my children playing, and I was doing a drawing. An elderly French lady came up with her son and grandchild and sat next to me. I'm drawing. We're watching our families play in a park. See, Andy? It, it was beautiful and, you know, unstructured and, and free space, etc. And this woman leans over and starts chatting to me in pure French, right? I don't even try, right? I would, I would insult an entire culture if I tried to take on French. So she went on, and I, I, I sort she knew real quick that I couldn't uh, speak French with her. And so she looked at me, pointed at the sign to the park, which said Paul Brisson Park, and she said some things, and then she held her hands up and went, do 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 and I was like, oh, a musician. She's like, oh, oui, oh, oui, Paul Brisson, musician, musician. And I was like, oh, that's great, right? It let me know where she was, where we were. She got the story across. And then, like in a game of tennis in slow motion, the ball is in my court. And I'm like, oh, man, where are you from, right? And I'm like, Georgia. Uh -huh. And she's like, I said, Itayuni, which as I understand it means United States. That didn't narrow things enough. And I eventually just kind of said, well, let's go for it. So I looked her in the eye, I screwed up my courage, and I said, wah, ba, ba, loo, ba, ba, la, bam, boom. And she went, oh, Georgia, Petit Richard. <laughs> right? So little did I know that wah, ba, ba, loo, ba is French from I'm from Georgia. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, this image that's behind me, is important. I had a whole sort of slew of slides I was going to show and they all went away yesterday when I was reminded of this piece by my friend Marianne Bates who's also an inmate of the Arts Exchange. This is her juiced up version and oftentimes art and its exaggerations is closer to the truth than what we see and I believe that in this case. When I came back to Macon in 94 with my beautiful bride, my freshly minted MFA, we lived at the corner of 2nd and Cherry, above what was then Lawrence Meyer, now it's the Greek Deli. Three flights of stairs, and all of my crap from a studio. If you've ever been to my studio on the other corner of the block, you know the kind of junk I can accumulate. It wasn't long before life and marriage was threatened by my collection of junk, so Greta sends me out, I think with a list, look for a studio, and I'd heard a rumor that back in 94, in this building, that there might be artists. Nothing for sure. I, I couldn't name but maybe five people in the city of Macon at the time. So I sat as a stranger to this city at this corner outside the door, waiting for somebody, knocking, no answer, knocking, no answer. A couple of days in the heat, in the late summer of 94, after the flood, if you guys remember that. And then one day, I'm knocking on the door and I see a shadow at the very top of the stairs. And then the shadow brings the head that belonged to it around the corner and he comes down the stairs. Tap, 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 tap. Then the next flight of stairs. Tap, 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 tap. Down at the bottom. Door opens. Can I help you? And I said, uh, I've heard there's studios here. Yeah. Anyways, I had met for the first time in my life Craig Burkhalter. <laughs> Craig showed me around this building that then was horrific, junk. You couldn't walk from room to room. Power might have worked in some of the spaces. Rodents ruled the day. No running water. No overhead lights. Doors missing, vending machines laying around. A complete disaster. I loved it. <laughs> oh, what it? OMG, that's the term, right? OMG. And Craig showed me both floors we did never met before, and we're standing at the top of the stairs that now I've been to thousands of times. And he said, well, what do you think? And I was trying to contain myself. I was like, man, that's just, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I like this. And I was going to go through the whole, what do I do? Who, you know, do you need a DNA sample? And he, <laughs> thank God he didn't. And he said, he said, well, what do you like? And I said, well, the corner here, this corner that I'd sat underneath on the second floor. I said, I like that area. And he, I'll never forget this, he, he grabbed a key and he gave it to me. And he said, all right. And, and I was, what do you mean? And he's like, you're in. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you 
how significant that one moment of human interaction with Craig Burkhalter, who's still my friend and, and we've known each other for years, what that brought me. It brought me freedom. It brought me purpose. It brought me roots to set down. I want to counterpose that to another story about Mercer. I'm not picking on Mercer. This is the things that an educational place ought to make you tough. When I was a student at Mercer, living a block from the art department, you used to have to get a pass to go do art. So if it's after dark, I had to get a pass and call the police and they'd let you in and you could draw or paint or whatever. Well, I was slack, lazy, never fooled with the passes. And so as a student, we knew which windows, usually Roger Jamison's office, if you know him, would be left open. And, and myself and a couple others would normally do this. And we would break into the art department to draw, to paint. And I can remember many nights being up there working on my senior show and hearing the door open downstairs. And it was Murpo, good guys, patrolling the building. But I was there without permission. And just as a matter of course, turning out the lights, hiding under the drawing table. <laughs> You'd hear him walk by, walking on his, talking on his walkie-talkie. He would leave and turning the lights back on and then going back to painting. That taught me a lot, but coming to Macon, getting into the Arts Exchange, into my studio, made me feel like I was no longer a thief in the night. It made me feel like it was okay. I didn't have to hide. I felt like I was set loose on that moment. So in that moment of being set free, and I promised some folks I would do this, and I hope that I do not insult my great hero in the world who is Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> I, the, my studio has a name. I call it Liberty Hall Studios. That is not some sort of bizarre right-wing movement. <laughs> I found out later from someone telling me that that was the name of the plantation of the uh, vice president of the Confederacy. It is not inspired by that. <laughs> Had no idea. It's from this section of a song that I'm going to speak for you. It's uh, This Hard Land by Springsteen. I hope I get the lyrics right. And it goes like this. And this is what inspired me and I think speaks to the nature of that place and this place. It says, from a building up on a hill, I can hear a tape deck blasting home on the range. And I could see those bar end choppers sweeping low across the plains. And it's me and you, Frank. We're looking for lost cattle. Our hooves twisting, churning up the sand. We're riding in the whirlwind, looking for lost treasure. Way down south of the Rio Grande. We're riding across the water in the moonlight up onto the banks of this hard land. Hey Frank, pack your bags and meet me tonight down at Liberty Hall. Just one kiss from you, my brother, and we'll ride until we fall. We'll sleep by the fields, we'll sleep by the rivers. In the morning, we'll make a plan, and if you can't make it, Stay hard, stay hungry, stay alive, and meet me in a dream of this hard land. Now that doesn't speak to the data importance of the place. It's the poetry of the place that has always affected me. And I got the space, I named it, I commenced to working, and then this group you know as the Arts Exchange completely, accidentally, without intent, started to form until that horrible moment with any organization where you find yourself having meetings <laughs> and agendas and officers. And there was a season where when we realized the studios were full, but well before First Fridays and those sorts of things, where we, I remember having debate after debate what to name ourselves. And the big issue was it got to be contemporary arts exchange and would it be dash or slash making? <laughs> dash or slash, right? That's where we were. This arts group, believe it or not, all of us artists, no, no interlopers trying to direct this thing. And we pursued vigorously nonprofit status. Get the paperwork. Find, you gotta have a board. You gotta have officers, you gotta have bylaws. 501c3, all of this technical stuff. And then, and it may have been pure accident, it, I'd like to think it was intent, I'd like to think it was grace. That uh, I remember being in an upstairs space and us sitting around and all of us coming to this moment of 
why are we going to do this? <laughs> right? It was kind of funny, but it was serious. And I think the group realized, and I want artists to know this, and I want the community to know this, that I was in a room with teachers, lawyers, and parents, and students, and retirees, and people who worked at nonprofit agencies, and for-profit agencies, and part-time and full-time, most having something to do with the arts. And we realized that the best thing we could do for Macon was not to form an empire, but to make art. And in that moment, we said, no, we've got to make things. That's the best thing we could do. You have to think about this. I spent a lot of time in the nonprofit business and making mostly, uh, well, that's another story. Um, where I've told this to the fellow members. When we first started, and you see hundreds of people up there on first Fridays when there's maybe a dozen. Success for us is not dollar driven. There is nobody there with a counter going, oh, one, two, three, we've got 50 people, right? We never have a meeting that says we didn't have 150 like we promised. We don't know or worry about how many people we're catering for, right? Success for us is simply being able to do work and having an opportunity to share. And that's a pretty low and down-to-earth notion of success, but it has worked for our organization, if you can call it that. So I think there's a lesson in there. Um, being in that space has allowed me, at once upon a time being a, a, a complete stranger on that corner, to witness the whirlwind that Springsteen speaks about. I have seen the renovations of that whole part of this town. Lawrence Meyer, the median's getting redone. The courthouse. I get to watch the bad things. Americans trying to parallel park. <laughs> Right? Waiting for the cop that keeps track of the time to come by to see if I need to go out and move my car. We've all done this, right? I've seen the homeless people ranting and raving. I've seen the restaurant put potatoes out on top of the newsstand for those homeless. I can hear all the traffic and noise of when the people get out of work. When the cleaning crew, the fickling building, gets out at nine talking to each I know who these people are now I, at a distance, but. Um, it's the whirlwind out there. You can, on Sundays, hear the flag blowing in the breeze and the halyards in front of the courthouse tap, 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 tap on those poles. And I'm thinking of all the things that are done for our arts group. For years, I would leave every Friday afternoon in desperate time crunch to go get ice for First Friday. <laughs> then one day, Michael of Michael and Mulberry's came upstairs and I said, Michael, where do you get ice? I need to... He's like, I, I've got an ice machine. Go down and get you some. Right? Oh, that, that has been one of the biggest reliefs. That practical moment of grace. So the things I want to spread in the spirit of Ted, I think, are first to the artists. Young, old, wherever you are, here in Macon and beyond. I want to say, number one, take root. Find a place. You don't have to be from there. But like I've learned in Macon, become a part of it. Raise a family. Get a job. Know the people that work below you. Get to a point where when you walk down the street, you're waving at the mailman. This is not exclusive to the artist, but we often get so wrapped up in our own personal whirlwinds we don't think that we need to know what's going on at Tattnall Park. We don't think that we need to know who's playing downtown. You need to have that texture in your life. You must have it. It is not a burden. It's a whirlwind, but it is a source of nutrients. Take root in a place, in a locale. Seek sanctuary. Liberty Hall and the Arts Exchange. When Marianne and I, Bates and I talk about this place, we, we call it Sanctuary. That's how she got this name. No matter what is whirling outside, no matter how many obligations, professional or personal, from the town, from outside of town, this is our sanctuary. It is the space and the time 
that we have to do what I think is the best thing we can possibly do for this town, which is to make good art. Find your sanctuary. It doesn't have to be physical. You need to have your mind, your feet, your hands, your eyes, your heart to have the room to breathe. The other comes from my dad. Coming all the way back to an art major. I didn't have parents that complained about it. My dad worked at textile mills his whole life. He's my hero. He was a colorist of all things. And he had one son, then two sons, go off to Mercer to study art. I have met students whose parents, upon the mention of an art major, freak out. I have a student recently who's, who worked for a relative of hers, and when he heard she wanted to be an art major, he fired her. Okay? My dad told me when I went off to school, and I knew I wanted to be an art major. He says, son, I don't care what you want to do. Just work damn hard at it, right? So all you artists, work. I have a punch clock at my studio. I don't want to hear it. There's no air conditioning. Too bad, right? Little Richard didn't have air conditioning. Not saying you're going to be that big, but if you're going to make Wap Bapa Lupa, you're not going to do it in the lap of luxury. You've got to work hard. It's easier to work hard in a place where you're rooted. Now for the community, just a couple of things. Do not be afraid to provide sanctuary. I have sat in my studio for going on 18 years and I have seen the untapped reserve of spaces and upstairs making. With collective will and a little bit of grace, you could give a studio to every kid who's studying art in this town. You could do it. You simply could do it. You can't measure art in terms of dollar signs. It's energy. Remember the simple graces. I see Jonathan here. Man, we're appreciative of making arts, the other institutions, the, 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 the foundations, the Cox Capital, all of those things are wonderful, but don't forget the small graces. Ice, right? Ice means as much sometimes as insert, lecture, talk, workshop, seminar, marketing development, virtual reality, here, right? Ice. It's okay to leave us alone to do our work, okay? We need that time. And I've said before, and I just want to reiterate it again, art is not going to translate directly into money. I don't think that. It's nice, <laughs> right? Sell the painting, I love that. I see some collectors out there. I have some new things you need to go. <laughs> you can't measure it, though, with dollars. Here's a suggestion. Measure it with ounces and gallons because it's fuel for that engine. If we're allowed the space, the little graces, the chance to take root, and if we promise and follow through with working hard, we can't help but to catch fire. That's what all of us want to do.